One idea can turn your life around. Deciding that you're going to focus to develop your skills. The guy was the new owner of a team, a team, a baseball team that was in the basement of the league when he took it over. He went to the pitcher and he said, what is your best throw? And he said, well, I got a good curveball and I've got a good fastball. And he went on talking about his different throws. He said, but tell me this, what is your best throw? He thought for a moment. He said, I've got a good fastball. He said, that's all I want you to work on. Nothing else. Just develop your fastball. The next year, they went to the World Series. Most people don't know where their fastball is. Most people go through life never discovering what their talents are. Most people never develop their talents. They have skills and abilities, but if you don't nurture them, if you don't develop them, they will never serve you. Your gifts can take you many places if you develop your gifts. Most of us don't like to do those things that come easy to us. I've always loved to talk to people. I decided taking this advice to develop my skills as a speaker and my gift has developed and it developed and has taken me many places. You have something that you brought to the universe and that if you decide that my life deserves my developing this what I do well and becoming the best at it and mastering myself and seeing what I have within me. If you decide to drop your buckets where you are and develop your gifts, I grant you, you'll never ever be without. I grant you that your gifts will take you places that will literally amaze you. I grant you that if you begin to work to develop your gifts, you'll develop a strong sense of happiness. You'll get a larger vision of yourself because part of beginning to get a larger vision of yourself, all of us need some area of our lives where we can have a feeling of competence. That people know when they think about this area, that's something you do. That you eat and sleep that. And that you do that. You do that. So you've got to work on it. Has everyone, anybody ever seen something for you that you didn't see it for yourself? I didn't see that for myself. Maybe that's why my favorite book says, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor is entered a heart of mankind what God has in store for you. Because of what he saw in me, he inspired me. He gave me a vision of myself beyond my circumstances, beyond my mental conditioning, and beyond the job where I was, because I thought I was just a disc jockey. I love that. I'm master a microphone. You drop me in any city, I can master a microphone. I can turn a city upside down with a microphone but I had more in me than I was expressing and I did not know it and because of this encouragement I became a community activist because of this encouragement I started doing a talk show called voice of the people because of this encouragement when I got out of radio I ran for the Ohio legislature and I was elected and because of this encouragement, I passed 14 bills my first term. Because of this encouragement, I was elected three times and became the chairman of the Human Resource Committee. Because of this encouragement, I became a public speaker. Because of this encouragement, I became an author. Because of this encouragement, I did a show for King World called The Les Brown Show, and they paid me $5 million, $2 million not to speak. Because of this encouragement, I produced specials for PBS, public television. They said, you couldn't do that. You don't have a college education. It's educational television. Because of his encouragement, I did so many things I had absolutely no idea that I could do. I encourage you to live full and to die empty. There's more in you right now than just working on a job where they pay you just enough to keep you from quitting and you work just hard enough to keep from getting fired. And when you make the decision and identify that key area of your life that you need to make a radical change, things will begin to open up for you. Now here's the other thing that's very important. Once you identify your goal, I want you to get, if possible, a visual picture of your goal. My major goal was to buy my mother a home. I got the picture of the home with a 12-foot swimming pool and a basketball court on a golf course. I bought that home for my mother. It cost just over $400,000, 10,000 square feet. I had a picture long before I had the money and the down payment to get it. My goal was to be known nationally and internationally as a speaker. I had that goal. I had a card that I had on one side, asking it shall be given, seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be opened. On the other side I had, I'm the world's number one orator. I produced that result in my life. I had a goal of becoming a talk show host. I used to watch Phil Donahue and I put my picture on the screen of the television as I listened to the program. I visualized myself there and I was called by King World Production and I had my own talk show. 
Well, it was the highest rated, fastest canceled talk show in the history of television. It's called life. Now, here's something else. You will fail your way to success. Trust me on that. You can have a lot of failures, a lot of disappointments, but you will fail your way to success. Goethe says, that which does not kill you will make you stronger. See, 85% of people allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. That's why you have to be of good courage. You have to have courage. When life knocks you down, I have a saying, try and land on your back, because if you can look up, you can get up. So once you look at and decide the goal that you want, you want to put some things, put a treasure board or a, a gold board and have pictures of the goal that you want to achieve so you can see it every day when you get up in the morning and the last thing at night, you're programming your subconscious mind where nine out of ten decisions that you make comes from there. I used to do door-to-door -door sales and I was working with another friend of mine and door-to-door -door sales, I mean, it's punishing. It's cruel and unusual punishment. And I was a little boy knocking on the door. Hello, would you like to buy a nice working television set? No money down. No! Bam! They slammed the door in your face. And the friend of mine that was working with me, they slammed the door in his face and I looked back and he was going to the car. He said, I can't do this. And he sat down in the car and he said, you go ahead, I'll be here when you get back. Now he had a mother and father to take care of him. My mother was ill. I am adopted. I was hungry. I had to go on. I learned something about myself, that when you step into your fear, somebody said it was Winston Churchill, he said that courage is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. When you step into your fears and continue to push yourself to go on, something happens for you. It will enable you to transcend yourself. I went to the next door. You like to buy a nice work and tell, no, bam. Went to the next one. No, bam. After a while, I no longer took it personal. And I began to play a game. I said, well, I know there's a yes out here somewhere. And I'm going to keep on until I find it. And I'm not going home until I do. And I continued to knock on doors. And then somebody eventually would say yes. And I said, are you sure? And I would go in there and I would get the sale. When you, when you have something you want to do, if you don't develop the courage to do that which has been given you to do, and you spend a lot of time going around trying to convince other people or trying to get their approval, what will happen is that you will lose your nerve and other people will convince you that what you're doing doesn't have any value and you'll give up on your dream. It's an interesting thing about life I've also found that if you don't have the courage to act, sometimes and particularly if you have something special to do, life will move on you. Abraham Maslow said that the life is about growth and he said you could either go back to your comfort zone and there you won't find any growth or you must willing, be willing to go forward and face your fears again and again and again because you're never going to have a, a fear-free existence. I mean, some fear is acceptable and legitimate. There are some things that you, you really should be afraid of. Now, you shouldn't allow it to immobilize you. You acknowledge it, you take it into account, and you carry yourself accordingly. There are times that we should proceed with caution, but it's the difference between being stopped by fear. It's the difference between having a fear and the fear having you. So what do we do? One, acknowledge it and knowing that it's okay. Don't condemn yourself for being afraid. It's perfectly fine to have some fears. You acknowledge your fears, you embrace those fears, and then you move on. You act on whatever it is that you fear. Because once you embrace it, see, what you resist will persist. What you resist will persist. So one of the most important things is to begin to embrace your fear. So what we've got to begin to do, how do we handle that? What's the process? Because it's all up in here. One, I think, is imagine the worst case scenario. Then I had another technique I used. Visualize yourself being more than able and capable of handling it. And I used to have a tremendous inferiority complex about speaking before people that I felt who had more going for them than I did. Because I'm not college trained, I used to feel that college people were the most intelligent people on the planet. And there was nothing I had to say for them. And what would I, what will they listen to me for? That's the way I felt. And so I had to, to visualize myself speaking before them, speaking before various audiences that had more going for them than I did, and realize and appreciate my own value 
and that I was a worthwhile person, even though I didn't have all going for me, I didn't have the money, I didn't have the education that they had. So part of the process is seeing yourself being worthy, being capable, having what you need to make you a worthwhile person, and that you're more than able, and that you deserve to be listened to, or you deserve to have that dream and that passion and whatever it is that you see and envision there. You've got to see it in your mind's eye and know that you've got what it takes. So deciding as you look at your life, as you look into the future and say, what fears am I holding on to? What fears that I'm allowing to imprison me that's keeping me from breaking out, that's keeping me from living up to my true potential, that's keeping me from really being happy, that's keeping me from having a sense of adventure and excitement in my life. What's, what's keeping me from controlling my destiny? What fears that I'm giving that permission to? Notice what I said, that we must give our permission to fear to immobilize us. Because whatever discomfort you experience, whatever challenges or difficulty that it is, you got to handle it got to go up in there and wrestle with it. Will it be easy? No. Will it be challenging? Yes. The next piece is that you accept yourself, then you accept the fear as a fact and not a force. See, when you accept yourself and you accept fear as a fact, that means that it's something that happens, it's something that you're going to experience, but it is not a force to hold you back. It doesn't have any special power other than that that you give it. So you accept the fact that you are afraid and then you move on anyhow. You move on past it and you do whatever you've got to do. See, when you are not filling your life with the things that you are capable of doing. See, we all have some stuff that we've been given. And I don't think that it's optional for us to sit on what we have. See, if you're sitting on what you have, what you've been given, and I think everybody's been given something to bring to the planet, that only you can do that, only you can perform that, only you can initiate that activity. And if you don't do that, if you're not filling in your life with your life work or your mission, then there are gaps in your life. And what we do when we're not living out our true identity, we begin to fill the gaps, we fill the holes with garbage. Alcohol, drugs, worry, self-destructive behavior. So when you begin to look at your life and you know that, that you're not doing what you can do because you have allowed yourself to be held captive by your fears. Here's what I discovered that happens to you in life, that you will go through things and while you're going through them, you can't understand why it's happening to you. But after you go through it, you get back and you look at it and you say, oh, now I understand why I needed that lesson. That I, did, I couldn't understand it then. But after I got through it, then I saw that that was preparing me for bigger and better things. That as you go through the challenges of life, and you look at it and embrace whatever comes to you, don't run from it, step toward it. Don't try and duck it like most people do. See, most people want it easy when you handle those hard things close at hand. Making those hard decisions right now that you don't want to make. 
learning those things that you don't like to do but you know that in order for you to get where you want to go this is one of the hoops that you have to flip through and I'm saying to you whatever you got to do do it because if you don't life is gonna whoop you until you surrender and say okay all right all right all right all right I cooperate okay I learned okay they had to wear me out a long time so if it's hard then do it hard now what do you how do you hang in there during the hard difficult times less you must have faith you've got to believe in yourself you've got to believe in your abilities you have got to believe in your service your company your ideas unquestionably you got to have faith and that faith gives you patience that is not going to happen as quickly as you want it to happen a lot of things are going to happen that will catch you off guard and so therefore you've got to deal with and handle it as it comes and not only that but that faith and patience drives you into action you got to keep moving and keep plugging away and some people ladies and gentlemen they stop because they don't see instant results it doesn't happen quickly they stop oh no 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 you got to keep on watering your dream when you're working at your dream somebody said the harder the battle the sweeter the victory oh it's sweet to you it's good to you why see when you when it's hard and there's a struggle see what you become in the process is more important than the dream that's far more important the kind of person you become, the character that you build, the courage that you develop, the faith that you're manifesting. Oh, it's, it's something that you get up in the morning, you look yourself in the mirror, you're a different kind of person. You walk with a different kind of spirit. And people know that you know what life is, that you have embraced life. You knew it was hard, but you did it hard. For us to begin to look at the future and know, that it's possible that we can have our dream. Yes, it is. Other people have done it, then we can do it. We fail a lot of times. Well, a lot of other folks fail, and eventually they came back and they succeeded. So it's possible we can have what we want. And we know that we want to get it. It's necessary that we align ourselves with people that think like we do. It's necessary we get negative, do-nothing people out of our lives. It's necessary we never stop learning and growing and developing ourselves. It's necessary that we never give up. We know that it's you, it's me. It's being responsible for our stuff and deciding that we're going to keep on keeping on, that we're going to find a way to win or find a way to make it happen. And we know it's hard. It's not going to be a picnic. Yes, it's hard. It's hard. And we will do it hard. And once it's, we do it hard and we go through it, we realize it was worth it. And once you discover it was worth it, it is done. Well, here's what I'm suggesting to you. That when you're working, you have a wall to break through. Let's say a friend of mine who walks, he runs a marathon. And he says, when he's running the 26-mile marathon, he said, let's say that hypothetically, that 18th mile is the wall. He said, Les, when you get there and you're running, he says, everything in you is telling you to stop, to give up. Every muscle is aching. And you're saying to yourself, I can't do it. I can't do it. And you just keep on and you keep on and you keep on. It seems like you're moving at slow motion. And then eventually when you break through that 18 mile wall, then you know it's like done and you're on automatic and you glide on in and you know it's there. You know you're going to get to the finish line. And we've all had experiences where we were working on something and we knew it was possible. And we did those things that were necessary to bring it into reality. We took the responsibility to make it happen. Other people couldn't see it. A lot of people didn't believe it. You were attacked. You were criticized. People were opposing you, but you kept on doing it. It was hard. It was rough. It was difficult. But to you, it was worth it. And eventually you got to a level you know, can nothing stop me now. I'm on.
finally, I'm thinking about a friend of mine who is no longer operating on this dimension. His name is Jack Bowler. He had this vision of a, of a church that would serve various types of needs for people, their supportive needs and helping them in, in recovery from drugs and alcohol and, and whatever addictions that they might be involved in. And he was known for bringing in different kinds of speakers. And over a year ago, he was diagnosed as having cancer and he announced to his congregation that he's going to be taking chemotherapy and that it was a possibility that the cancer would go in remission and he was optimistic about that. And sure enough, it did for a year. And one of the things Jack always talked about is that he wanted to have his funeral while he lived. And so he invited a few friends, Wayne Dyer and myself and a few other speakers. He didn't tell us why we were there, but once we gathered there the church, they told us in the room that Jack is going to announce to the congregation, he's bringing his doctor up, the doctor is going to say that we felt we could get, keep it in remission, it's out of remission, and he doesn't have much time left. And whatever words you want to say to Jack that you would say if he had made his transition, speak those words now. Well, we were shocked and, and we were somewhat stunned until Jack got there. They brought him in in a wheelchair and, and boy was he courageous and, and he had a strong smile and they helped him up the steps and he sat behind the podium and each of us got up and we said a few things about Jack and the impact that he made on our lives. And he said, the doctor after announcing that Jack didn't have long, he says, doctor, he said, I accept what you say but it's possible that that does not have to be the case. But if it is, I will enjoy life to the very last breath I take, even the chemotherapy. I will enjoy that. And Jack did, ladies and gentlemen. And when they said that all of his vital organs were failing, they called his family and his close church staff to the hospital and said he's dying. And so they came and they all gathered in the room. And Jack at that time was unconscious and he gained consciousness and he looked at them and he said well what strength he had he said I want to thank you all for being here you've been a great staff to me he looked at his sons and his daughter he said you've been a great family he said don't feel sorry for me he said I'm I'm ready to go I'm I'm looking forward to the next adventure and he sat there for a little while, laid there, and he closed his eyes, and, and he lost consciousness. About an hour and a half later, he opened his eyes, and he looked at them, he said, This is embarrassing, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> they were laughing through their tears. He said, Hey, I hate giving up this kind of control. So they predicted that Jack would die at the end of February. And then on the second, they said, he won't see the light of day. He will be dead by morning. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack died on March 4th. And we believe that even in his dying, Jack sent his congregation a message that I want to give to you with his permission. March 4th is the day he died. And we believe Jack was saying, March 4th.